Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and producer of these chats that are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm speaking with Thor Stockman. Thor is an old school San Francisco and New York City leather man. Thor is also the surviving partner of David Stein of GMSMA. How are you this evening, Thor? I'm pretty good, thanks. A little nervous, but um, not used to being interviewed. This is maybe my my second that I've sat for. Well, you're not totally a virgin. So. Fair enough. There you go, then. All right, Thor, I'd like to start right at the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about where you're from, a little bit about your family. Yeah, um, I grew up in small towns all over Southern California. Uh, which is why I'm living in a large metropolitan city um, today. I, um, it wasn't the small town so much as the small town mentality of the people who live there. I remember uh, when I was in high school, and it wasn't that small of a town. I mean, it was like 30,000 people. Oh. Um, an adult bookstore opened up. This was in the mid-70s. And um, the outraged city council, mayor, police department could not work fast enough, oh, you know, on any excuse they could to shut it down. It's not, and they had like very, very, they didn't even have any window displays or anything. They just said adult bookstore outside. Okay. And well, that, I just kind of felt like that was like totally wrong and unfair and unnecessary censorship. Um, so that was what I knew I needed to get away from. And like so many gays and lesbians of my generation, I realized as I was going through high school, I would need to move to a larger city to be with more people like me. Um, I mean, bottom line is that it increases your chance opportunities for sex. <laughs> you know, let's, let's say it that, but yeah. Um, so as soon as I graduated from high school, I could not move off to college fast enough. Um, and uh, thankfully I had an, enough money and grades to get me into San Jose State University. Oh, very good. Um, so that's where I ended up. My family was, um, of modest means, uh, lower middle class, I guess, um, my, I had two sisters, one older and one younger. My father was not good at being a father, and uh, I never felt loved by him. Um, more's the pity. Um, but I guess the only thing, only positive thing that came out of that was that I feel it made me a better man myself, is that I've always tried to give the men in my life from friends to tricks to lovers, to partners, um, the love I never experienced growing up. Uh, my parents separated when I was 13 and he died a year later um, of alcoholism. And um, it took me, I didn't realize this until years later as an adult, but that was basically a slow form of suicide. Uh, yeah, and both of those things, <clears throat> I've never really been able to get over with. He also was clearly unhappy, not only in his role as father, which I guess you know, society at that time was told that's what you're supposed to do. You know, you serve in the war, you come home, you get married, you buy a house, you raise a family, and he just checked out. Um, but because he was so unhappy in his uh, job or his, his career, um, I was never career oriented myself. As long as I had a job that, um, you know, paid the rent and put food on the table, I was fine. Let's take a step back. You mentioned the bookstore in your hometown. Did the city succeed in shutting it down? Oh, yeah. Within, within two months of it opening. But uh, at, I think I was 15 and I rode my bicycle down to the, uh, the town library 
um, and tried to find out anything I could about homosexuality, uh, which is the, the term everybody knew. It. That's the only term that everybody knew it as at that time, even though Stonewall had occurred uh, two or three years earlier. Uh, that wasn't, um, the public really didn't know anything about that. Um, and all I could find was a musty old tome, some encyclopedia from the United Kingdom um, that had like two paragraphs with a clinical description of essentially, oh, these are people who uh, like, um, are attracted to um, members of their own sex. Um, and that wasn't really helpful. It's like, well, I kind of figured that out on my own. Is there anything else you could tell me? Um, and that, as I said, that was it for the entire library. And what was worse is that there was this huge bestseller at the time, um, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex. It was on the top of bestseller lists for like half a year. And it's, it had an entire chapter on homosexuality written by a purported psychologist. Let's see, no, or psychiatrist, not sure which. And it was full of lies um, about who and what gay people were. Such as? Um, well, that, and it was all based on like a single patient of his who was obviously very unhappy being um, homosexual, um, but that was, so many of us were back then. I mean, take a look at Boys in the Band um, because that's what society, that was the only message we were getting from society at large. Um, we, for the most part, had no um, heroes or people to look up to. Um, so, anyway, but some of the things in the book were like um, that homosexuals uh, lead it sad, unhappy uh, lives, have no satisfying uh, sex, uh, sex lives, are scurrying around in dark corners um, and parks. Um, they like to wear the um, uniform of train operators because it makes them feel I don't know, more butch or something, you know, the, the blue and white striped um, overall, coveralls, overalls, there we go, and um, uh, red hankies in the back pocket and everything. And even that, as a teenager, uh, was so laughably stupid. I knew that. But unfortunately, as I later came to learn, is that this is what informed um, most of the American public of who we were, what we were like, that we didn't deserve any dignity or rights and did a lot of damage. And I'm still angry over it because uh, the good doctor um, or the, the hideous doctor never um, apologized or corrected all of his misstatements of it, even though he was um, held to it. I mean, today he would be, you know, laughed out of his profession. But back then he could uh, get away with it. And he was also, you know, now handsomely rich by selling literally, I don't know, six, seven million copies. Anyhow, I still, yeah, <laughs> blood pressure visibly risen. You mentioned you went off to the library looking for information on homosexuality. Why that topic? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously I had was had no or little interest in girls, even though that was what was fed to all of us kids growing up as what you're supposed to like. Um, I had crushes on uh, other kids in um, 
school, ju- e- starting in junior high, um, and uh, and you know other other boys um, getting through gym class with all the jock straps and um, <laughs> group showers was always uh, interesting, um, but. Um, But did you then, have a then um, what I did was I was a prolific, voracious reader, and I loved newspapers and magazines. And I found um, both the Los Angeles Free Press, one of the country's more infamous underground newspapers, um, and um, The Advocate. Um, in street racks, which I could buy for 50 cents. And back then, The Advocate was a twice-monthly newspaper with an entire section of personal ads, as did um, the LA Free Press. And a lot of people bought both publications just for the ads. And so, yeah, I it took me a while, for instance, to, to figure out what terms like Greek active and French passive meant. Um, but yeah, I use those a lot to both whack off to, as well as learn more about gay people and sex. What I, what I would love to understand for the audience is, did you even have a concept on homosexuality? How did that idea even uh, germinate in your head? To be well, able to go look it up. It didn't, and it was probably slow and organic at the t- time. All I was no- known is that all you're conditioned to by family, by school dances, everything, is that I was supposed to like girls. Right. I was supposed to want to kiss them. I was supposed to want to touch them. I was supposed to want to have sex with them. And I didn't have any interest in doing that. Now we had some images in um, uh, popular media, uh, such as um, the original Batman television series, Wild Wild West. Uh, I know I used to also jerk off to like boxing shows. And um, back then there was male roller derby. (laughs) <laughs> and um, those were the more vivid ones I remember. And there's others, um, the uh, black scuba suits, uh, rubber suit, scuba suits, and uh, the uh, male external, ca- ex- yeah, male external ca- catheters in the Sears catalog. All of that, you know. The So in addition to like, obviously being gay, but not at all understanding it, much less accepting it, I was also kinky from a very early age. If you remember when you're very young, kids would talk about anything and everything. They'd sit around in circles and gossip. And one of the things I think, I don't know, I think it was maybe seven or eight. Um, yeah, no, it was eight or eight or nine. Um, we were talking about uh, what happens when you go to the hospital to have your tonsils out, which back then meant an overnight stay. Um, And some kids who had already had done that told me that if you don't behave while you're in the hospital, they tie you to your bed frame so that you're not getting out of bed and running around. And that absolutely fascinated me and uh, thrilled me to the point where um, at night in bed, I would roll up my um, bed sheets and tie them together, much like you've seen in cartoons where somebody's escaping from a upper floor window and climbing down. Um, and I used that to tie my ankle um, to the bedpost. And then I would, eat, this was long before puberty, and then I would touch myself down there. And there wasn't any, any erection. And, um, but I found it pleasurable. Hmm. And then, you know, I would eventually untie myself and put my, have to remake the bed and uh, 
and go to sleep, you know, so my mom wouldn't find out that I was doing this weird stuff. Um, but when I remembered this after coming out um, into SM as an adult and becoming sexually active, I thought it was hilarious, but also fascinating that I was into certain aspects of kink and SM at a very early age. So what took you away from your, your small town and your discoveries and finding the advocate and other things on a uh, shop shelf, I guess you said, or somewhere? Where did you go? Uh, well, you know, as soon as I graduated from high school, I really felt like I could not get away from the small towns or small town mentality quickly enough. Um, and that's been, for gays and lesbians of my generation, that's been well documented. They felt they need to move to bigger cities so that they would be around more people like them and perhaps um, better attitudes about people who are, are different or nonconformist. Um, fortunately, my grades and um, the amount of money I had uh, got me into San Jose State University, oh. which also had some programs that I was interested in. But that was in the northern part of the state. And for the first time in my life, I was living by myself, although, you know, in dorms. And um, I was there uh, for a couple of years. Um, and from there, um, I had gotten some summer jobs that were uh, first in Oakland and then in San Francisco, only because I couldn't find anything locally. So that was my introduction to San Francisco. And so from there, I moved to San Francisco and, um, and got a job there. Tell me about that. What job were you doing? Um, I didn't finish with any degree. I had only done two years at oh. San Jose and I was getting good grades, but kind of felt like I wasn't getting a good education. It was very hard putting myself through a college with jobs. Um, so I decided to reverse. Them. Oh, and I was having trouble coming out too. I was still struggling with that. Um, so, I mean, while I was in college, I actually went to see at one of the repertory cinemas, Boys in the Band. Oh. And um, that scared the shit out of me. Why? Um, and I feel that it, it was responsible for keeping me in the closet and from fully accepting my gayness for another full year. And the reason why is that the movie was full of uh, self-hating, bitter, alcoholic men who would pretty much spend their lives uh, saying bitchy things to each other. And I thought, oh my God, does being gay mean I'm going to be one of these unhappy people? Um, so yeah, I was conflicted about that. So I decided to uh, reverse it and I started going to school uh, college part-time at night and working full-time. Uh, once I moved into the city, um, I wasn't able to find any job, entry-level jobs in uh, the fields that interested me, but I had very good clerical skills from my years on the staffs of junior high school and high school uh, yearbooks and news newspapers. So, and you know, I could, I could type really well. And we were just at the advent of memory typewriters and then early word processing systems. It was still long before personal computers, but there were dedicated systems like IBM and Wang. And so I was good at that. I had good office skills. So worked as administrators and uh, legal secretaries for a number of years. Um, while I continued uh, coming out. And that was still frustrating for me because I was still a virgin um, and living in San Francisco in the go-go years and felt very unattractive. Um, I felt like the world's oldest virgin, which I later learned I was not, but it was frustrating at the time. 
So tell us about the San Francisco you experienced. It was a, an amazing time. Well, I, you know, while I was still in college in San Jose, I discovered Drummer Magazine and um, like starting with issue two or three. And then I also found a copy of Larry Townsend's The Leatherman's Handbook. Okay. Very educational because both of them were both trying to do sort of like some documentary work, but they were also porn. Um, so that really shaped me as a Leatherman a great deal, even though it was still a few years before I had any experience on my own. And of course, there were gay newspapers in San Francisco. And I was reading, there was some of the earliest books that were written there. What would that be? Around 76, 78. Um, sort of like the first generation of post-Stonewall writing, I discovered the Walt, Walt Whitman uh, bookshop, bookshop and um, bought a lot of stuff there. But there were uh, these books, um, Jonathan Ned Katz, I forget some of the other authors, uh, about how to come out and how to um, be a happy, happy homosexual. Um, and actually, more than that, a gay person um, who, you know, accepted themselves. Uh, I remember using one of them when I went home for my older sister's wedding. Uh, and I was like running into the bathroom to read certain pages to build up the courage to come out to my mom, which I did. Um, and there were others that said, you know, instead of just the bars, bars aren't the only way to, or for that matter, the parks, cruising in the parks, there are better, more wholesome ways to uh, meet other people, gay people, and become involved in the gay community. You should seek out gay community centers, become involved with gay groups. I mean, there weren't even things that everybody now just takes for granted, like, yeah. um, say gay courses where every large city has one now. And San Francisco didn't even have a gay community center in large part because it had so many, it had dozens of gay bars, yeah. but there was a, a um, down in the basement of the Unitarian church, there was a weekly gathering and I went to that. And then I also got involved in, uh, gay politics, because our community was being attacked at the time, both by Anita Bryant uh, down in Florida with the Save Our Children campaign, as well as uh, a state legislature from Orange County, uh, John Briggs, who introduced um, the Briggs Initiative, uh, later known as Proposition 6, that was basically doing the same thing, sought to ban or um, any gays or lesbians from working um, in the state public schools. Okay. Uh, and just like the um, laws that were once again, you know, passed in Florida, um, the language was so vague is that the California law would have made it impossible to be openly gay, even if you were a janitor or even said the word homosexual um, in the school or your teachings or in response to a question. And so there was a grassroots um, a group called Bay Area Committee Against the Briggs Initiative, also known as Bacabi. And I went down to their storefront in the Castro District and volunteered my services. Now, we, let's take a step aside here for a minute before we get into the to the meat of that were you still in the process of coming out at this point where were you personally well suddenly take such a big step clearly I was pretty sure I was gay I still didn't have the last piece of evidence uh, okay. <laughs> um that would like okay I really am gay I guess if I if I finally have the um uh, the, this last piece to the puzzle. And, and the, the Briggs, 
sorry. That's okay. Um, so yes, I, uh, I was doing these things as advised by the books in order to meet other people, both because I believed in it, but also to meet other people, gay men who maybe I could have sex with, get some experience. I also have to say that I did try placing ads um, in Drummer Magazine and personal ads and The Advocate and went out on a number of dates and none of those were fruitful. Let's take, let's come back to the Briggs Initiative because that's very important. It's a very big, important historical piece in the community. You said you went to the office to volunteer. What transpired with that? Okay, well, <clears throat> Bacabi, as I said, was um, grassroots, all volunteer, and firmly believed in progressive coalition politics, which means that we would align ourselves with groups that were fighting for the rights of farm workers in the state, saying, you support what we believe in um, will, and we'll support your struggle as well. I didn't even know what that meant back then, but as I was 20 years old, you know, then I, and that, that was the thing. And so a lot of our work was uh, to, to fight to fight this was um, passing out flyers, um, holding, organizing and holding um, uh, rallies and, and speak outs, um, mailing parties where we would like fold and stuff, seal, address stamp thousands of envelopes, urging people to, um, you know, vote against this horrible proposition. Um, later, uh, it's uh, later in the whole procedure um, of the of propositions, they're finally given numbers. And at that point, there were other like more corporate groups that had like paid staff that would do fundraising from wealthy businesses and individuals to like buy media. But we were sort of like the grassroots arm. And then there were other groups that were also fighting this as well. Um, and when we um, first started that year, um, the number of people against this proposition was vastly outnumbered by those who supported it. And that was also the year that Harvey Milk ran for a seat on uh, the city's board of supervisors. And, but a little bit more, I wanna talk a little bit more about what I did for Bacabi. I had design skills. Um, so I designed most of their flyers and posters. And one of the things I did is that I gave them all a sort of um, cohesive look by using the same distinctive typeface. I can even name it to this day, ITC Karina. So if you saw something like that, oh, this is from Bacabi. Of course, our, our name in big letters was at the bottom of it as well. But when it came time for uh, the June parade, Pride Parade, uh, we also needed to make signs and banners. And uh, so I went into work on uh, a Saturday and um, made a set of stencils in the same typeface, 10 inches high, and those were used to trace and then paint uh, the letters on huge bolts of cloth we had dyed. And then you stick them onto uh, broomsticks to hang, you know, hold high over our heads. Um, and uh, we also made signs that said, no, on the Briggs Initiative, B-A-C-A-B-I at the bottom. And we printed up thousands of those um, and distributed them to all the groups throughout the parade. And so um, that was also the year that Harvey Milk rode in a convertible in the parade. So if you Google Harvey Milk and parade, up will come photographs. And because there were so many of these signs, they are in almost every photograph you will see. So if I ever want to see examples of my work, <laughs> early examples of my work, that's all I have to do. Um, and by the end of the, the election come November, 
we had turned the tide and won that, uh, or rather defeated that proposition. Um, I think it was like uh, 58 to 31, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, 58 to 31 or 32. Um, and which was absolutely phenomenal to yes. uh, change the public's opinion that much. And that was done because a lot of gays and lesbians, excuse me for tearing up here, um, learned the importance of coming out and telling their, their family, their friends, their co-workers who they were. And why it was um, important to defeat this. It, in hindsight, it's largely considered um, California's Stonewall. Yes. <clears throat> and I'm very proud of my political involvement um, I, uh, at that time, I would go on to do, uh, do other stuff, mostly for GMSMA, but I kind of felt like I had earned my first gay merit badges. I knew I was only interested in leather bars and that as, you know, still essentially a starving college student, I didn't have the money for leather. All I had was a pair of old used army boots, but I also realized thanks to, I don't know, maybe maybe the village people, is that um, a army uniform would get me in. And uh, this was just a few years after our withdrawal from Vietnam. So uh, there was tons of really cheap um, military stuff in the um, army navy surplus stores. So, you know, for very little money, I went down and bought myself a full army grunt uniform, complete with a white t-shirt and dog tags, wore it, um, and then knew which bar to go because I was interested in the heaviest leather bar of the period, which was the arena. I knew that from my reading of, you know, the, the bar rags and drummer. And um, then, um, and uh, this has never happened again. I get into the bar, buy a beer, find a place to stand. And within two minutes, I'm approached. And the guy, you know, grabs me by the, uh, the front of my shirt, pulls me close and growls into my ear. Are you willing to obey me tonight? Um, and uh, gosh, it was like out of a, a porn scenario. And um, I said, yes, sir, and went home. And we did all sorts of fun stuff. And this is, the reason I want to tell you this is a very good thing happened in the early hours when we fell into bed at around dawn and engaged in just a little bit of pillow talk. And I told him that I would sometimes still have guilt and shame about my interests and what I got off on. And he just asked me a couple questions that seemed very simple now, but had never occurred to me. And the first was, he says, well, do you enjoy this? And the obvious answer was yes. And he says, does it hurt anybody else? And again, sounds so simple, but I'd never thought of that way. The answer was no. Right. And with that, a huge, another huge weight lifted off my shoulders. And um, I've never looked back. Uh, again, not an ounce of um, uh, shame or guilt about um, who I am or what I enjoy. And that's beautiful. Yeah. It seems so simple, but at the time, didn't, didn't understand it myself. But I was very blessed to have that person um, remove any stigma that I was still carrying around because of uh, what society was teaching me. 
So you spent a wonderful time in uh, San Francisco. You learned a lot. You worked for the, uh, rather against the Briggs Initiative. Why the move to New York? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I met David Stein, who lived there, a mutual friend. He was coming out to San Francisco on his first visit there, and a mutual friend gave him my name and number. And um, he called me, he came over. I took him on the grand tour of the city because I love playing tour guide and uh, I love being in, um, an urbanite, um, bookstores, restaurants, other cultural things. We had sex. Um, and then we stayed in touch um, more by letter than phone. Um, it was still decades before the internet. And um, it sounds unlikely, but um, as our correspondence got more personal um, and maybe even a little flirty, or on my part, maybe even a little bit of seduction. Um, we fell in love long distance through our correspondence of more than a year. How romantic. Well, it's not anything you hear about much these days, but yeah, uh, I guess it was. I think he was an editor and um, I was, a, you know, did a lot of writing. Uh, myself. So that was just our preferred medium of correspondence, of communication, is, I guess is what I meant to say. So um, I went out there a couple times to New York. The first time actually with the mutual, to visit to, and stay with the mutual friend who introduced us. And then the second time, while we were considering um, uh, being a couple, he begged me to move out there to be his master. Uh, and the reason I would go to him is that he was older, more advanced in his career. And the thought was, is that I would finish my, or I could finish my degree at any number of colleges in, in here in New York City. Um, so after that, a test worked out so well, which also included seducing me with like a Broadway show and a home cooked five course Chinese feast. Um, I agreed to his suggestion um, or his offer, I guess I should say. And um, however, I had to do it on my terms. He was happy to give me the money for the move. But I said, no, this is something I need to do on my own. So I worked two jobs for a little more than six months to save up the money to move out there. Um, that's what got me to New York. And I realized, you're, if I can jump ahead uh, for my point, is that I, is that I realized that I had had New York ideation for many years before actually doing this. Maybe I, maybe I willed it, I don't know. But I remember as early as high school, I was reading The New Yorker and then New York Magazine, which was just starting. Milton Glaser and Clay Felker were essentially inventing the new journalism. And uh, then college, um, the Village Voice and uh, the Sunday New York Times. And to me, New York was always this like center of sophistication. Um, all the shows I grew up watching um, where the panel uh, of Let's Make a Deal and the talk shows and they'd be wearing gowns and tuxedos and exchanging witty banter. And uh, with the the fake mural of the city lights in the background. Um, and of course, then in college, when I was started, I was able to see old movies again, even though they were probably filmed on back lots in, in Hollywood, again, New York was always this bastion of sophistication. 
So it all we I always had this attraction to it, and now I was living in oh the you know as it's called the greatest city in the world. Um, and it wasn't until David's death uh, a number of years ago that I realized that this part of me and that I would have never moved. I don't think I would have ever had the guts to move to New York on my own. David's invitation made it possible. And thus he's responsible for much of the happiness I've had in my life. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Tell us a little more about the New York you you met, the places, the uh, iconic bars. Well, uh, there is the mine shaft, and I'm actually uh, the my backdrop here is the original street entrance to that sex club. I guess I should say infamous sex club, <laughs> although I was I just did the math uh, earlier today, um, and it was closed. Um, 37 years ago, in 1985, during the AIDS hysteria by the city um, as a response to the AIDS crisis in lieu of doing anything at all helpful or constructive. It was like, oh, we're taking action here. Um, and the bars, there was the Eagle, the spike, later the lore, the altar. Those were just the um, the, the most popular leather bars that uh, I, I was here for. Um, Impressions? Well, I had David as a slave. So I would go largely socially or when gay male SM activists, which I'll now just refer to as GMSMA, um, had events there, fundraisers, social bar nights, um, et cetera. Um, but yeah, even though ostensibly for me as the master, it was an open relationship, um, David kept me pretty busy and very satisfied. Um, but I certainly loved all of the other cultural attractions and offerings that New York had, museums, um, theater, restaurants, and also living in a multicultural melting pot, hearing language, music, food, other people that really wasn't exposed to in small towns in Southern California. When I go back and visit my uh, one of my sisters who's like in a moneyed part of Orange County, and all I see are white people except for the Hispanic uh, gardeners, I get physically uncomfortable because it's what I'm no longer used to. Um, and it's like, this really isn't the America I'm comfortable with. So you alluded earlier to an amazing gay leather scene, amazing gay scene in general in New York City. You alluded to some of the bars and, and uh, being able to go there with David, but you've never really told us who David was. David, um, first off, more than anything, other than being um, as accomplished and hardworking, and passionate and very lovable was very, very smart. And that always attracted me, probably because I felt it was something that I lacked myself. So, you know, if when I'm asked if I have any type, well, intelligence is, is up there on things that turn me on. Um, and that certainly came through in his letters and his interests. Uh, he was a doctorate student in philosophy and left that uh, basically uh, for, for his own journey of coming out and wanting to be a part of the gay community. Um, and he was one of the editors of the Pittsburgh Gay News, 
uh, which, uh, believe it or not, was the, the country's first city gay newspaper, even a, ahead of New York. San Francisco at that time only had bar rags, and even Boston's gay community news. So interesting little footnote there. And um, later he would also move to New York and get involved with the National Gay Task Force before they added the L for lesbian. And um, then um, became hugely involved, uh, a founding member of, gay ma of GMSMA, um, which was formed uh, there were group. There were essentially only two groups um, that predated that were um, gay and about SM. That would be the Chicago Hellfire group, and I think um, San Francisco's the Fifteen Association was a year older. And they weren't. They didn't want to hold um, sex parties. Can I say sex parties? Yes. Um, they. <clears throat> Uh, were interested in being politically active, taking the mystery and the danger out of SM and maybe shining a little light on it. Um, up until then, it had be been a very closed society as kind of documented in the Leatherman's Handbook where you kind of had to know somebody in order to even know where the leather bars were. Yeah, um, they they didn't necessarily like advertise way back when, and getting to know people and getting trusted, and essentially they wanted to be educational and social, political, all of those things, and they were. Uh, GMS May, largely through David's hard work, um, and many other people too. It was by no means a one man operation. Had a Host. It had dozens of volunteers and upwards of 400 paid members at one time at its at its wow. height. Wow. So they had twice monthly meetings that again program meetings which ran the gamut of edu mostly educational. But there were some that were social, uh, cultural, some that were social, some that were. You know, like demonstrate. They also had demonstrations and hands-on workshops, um, parties, uh, fundraisers, and many, many, many firsts, which um, are young people. Not that they need to care, um, are just um, they're unaware. Have 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 today, and don't even think twice about it. So many of these things, GMSMA did it for the first time. Um, and I was very involved too, um, as an officer, a hard worker, um, helping David on all of his projects um, and encouraging him and essentially being an editor's editor for all of his writings, which were extensive. Um, and so very proud of my contributions to GMSMA's many, many achievements. And here's another fun fact. Um, I coined the concept and the term leather pride. Did you? It is hard to wrap your head around it that at the time nobody had ever put those two words next to each other huh. but there was also a time that nobody thought that being gay was something you could be pr proud of either but the thing was is that uh, gms may had this fundraiser each year called pride night at the spike the spike being a leather bar where we would raise money for the city's um committee that organized and uh, the Gay Pride March each year, Heritage of Pride, mm -hmm. uh, previously the Christopher Street Day Liberation Day Committee. Sizzledeck, then it became Heritage of Pride, which it still uses now. And it's hard to believe that the few thousand dollars that we raised 
from a bar night at a leather bar was a big deal, but back then it was. It gave them the seed money to produce a lot of what they needed to do. Um, uh, rent chairs, you know, sure. bonds, yes. paint. They actually had a separate fundraiser for that, but even to paint the lavender line down Fifth Avenue, only because the um, St. Patrick's Day parade, uh, which had excluded gays for decades, um, painted green line down yes. Fifth Avenue. So we wanted that too. So anyhow, Pride Night of the Spike, and after a few years, it got had gotten so popular and uh, overcrowded that we needed to find a larger venue and thus uh, a name change. So I was on the phone with Brian O'Dell, another one of GMS May's founders, and I suggested, how about Leather Pride Night? And these days there's, uh, I, I think, uh, and that was the name and that on the flyer. Um, and um, it was, we moved it to the St. Um, Disco and Nightclub in the East Village. And for the first time raised five figures instead of just a few thousand. Wow. Yeah. You know, for late, late 80s, that, that was... That was pretty good, again, because of the hard work of many, many individuals. Um, Patrick Califia was one of uh, the MCs that night um, and uh, did a great job. So, um, yeah, there's that. But, you know, if not, I, I know that there's Pride Night this and Pride Week and that and Pride everything. And it also, of course, got a huge boost because Tony de Blas designed uh, the leather pride flag behind you there. Yes. Um, uh, 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 I think probably a couple years later after the uh, term got, and Tony smartly recognized, you know, in its, for its time, what a revolutionary concept leather pride was. Yes, yes. But the, the, the flag just made it go stratospheric Tony's leather pride flag was the first pride flag after the gay rainbow pride flag. And of course, now we have yeah, all sorts of pride flags. Ones, yeah. But you know, I can't, you know, as they say, that and $2.75 uh, will get you on the subway. But nonetheless, it's still something I'm personally proud of. And, you know, if it wasn't me, it would have been some somebody else really soon um the world only spins forward so you were in new york city even in san francisco at a very tumultuous time you were coming from a wonderful time in history which was party and fun and and sexual exploration and then the go-go years yeah suddenly you're hit with the aids epidemic tell us how your community responded to that I'm going to need to get my hanky here. And since that's, since I'm sitting on it, I'll just pull a Kleenex. Uh, this is going to be difficult. Um, it was scary. It was horrifying. Um, our friends were dying horrible, painful deaths um, within months of contracting the disease. Um, GMS May lost two of its presidents and any number of its members. I had friends who were held the hands of their dying lovers and bearing them only to die of AIDS themselves just a, a few months later. Um, but what was even worse was societies, our political leaders, our educators, our doctors and medical professionals and their response. Um, they were happy about our extermination. They were calling for us to be 
shipped off to an island. Uh, they were laughing about us in Reagan's White House uh, meeting rooms. Um, doctors refusing to treat us. Um, very little compassion, very little funding. Um, we had to fight for years to get um, funding for treatment and prevention and research. And so when I saw how quickly um, all of these areas pivoted during the latest pandemic to fund um, research and treatment, That's it only caused PTSD and maybe <laughs> made me relive those period all, all over again. But you survived the AIDS pandemic. Why, why did you survive? What do you think happened there? Here's a, a deep dark secret, which I haven't shared with many people. Um, it's basically because of my looks and my size, I didn't have as much sex as most of the people who uh, we lost to AIDS. Um, and that's a sadness and a heaviness that I carry with me to this day. I know I should be rejoice in surviving a um, surviving that era and still being alive, but that's how that's my feeling about it. You know, growing up, I was made fun of a lot uh, because of my my size and my looks, and uh, you know that sticks with you. How do you want David Stein to be remembered by the community? Um, David did a lot of work for many other groups besides GMSMA. He was the safety columnist for Bound and Gagged. He was a writer and editor and publisher of uh, numerous uh, books for the uh, leather community, uh, both nonfiction and fiction. Um, uh, both himself and other people. Um, he contributed a lot of writing. Uh, he actually coined uh, the, the phrase and the concept, safe, sane, consensual. But he was also a very shy and unassuming person like me and um, was fine kind of like being in the background. He also did not suffer fools gladly and did not allow a lot of people into his um, circle of friends. Um, but I know that those that who remember him or who were touched by his many contributions um, think very fondly of him. Um, like David, I, I guess I just want to be remembered fondly by my friends. And I actually uh, plan on bribing them to do so. Um, in, in my will, uh, for a small circle of friends, I've left them enough money to enjoy a nice meal out with a friend or partner and toast my memory. That's beautiful. On a lighter note, what advice can you offer a new person coming into today's leather BDSM community. Thinking back about my own coming out, I actually have to quote a old school um, icon, um, and that would be Bette Midler's song, You've Got to Have Friends. 
Um, it's very, very important for you to do the work to cultivate friendships, both real life and online. You need that support system in order to grow in a society that is still very negative of who we are yeah. and our lives. Yeah. So that will help a lot. But other than that, it's also like, from what the books told me, is like, get involved, um, both in the vast number of uh, group, gay groups that are out there uh, based on interests and activities, sports, culture, um, and also, um, you know, doing political work, uh, which uh, once again is very necessary because so much of our um, queer youth and trans people are being attacked. Yeah. So there's, there's I, I guess my, my late in life viewpoint is that there's still work to be done. And in a larger sense, there will always be work to be done. So, yes. you know, in whatever way you can, whether it's going to meetings or rallies, talking about it with friends, educating yourself, um, you know, work toward that sort of progress. Oh, and I, obviously voting. Yeah. I mean, it, it, these all sound like simple concepts, but um, that's my advice. What's the biggest misconception about you? That was the wild card question, which I've never really uh, thought of or answered for myself. And I have to say is that I'm not a heavy, rough, tough Leatherman 24 seven. Um, I love language and how it's changed by young people and subcultures. Um, you know, I, I watch RuPaul's Drag Race mostly to keep up with slang <laughs> and enjoy using it myself. Again, really, when, when the proper occasion exists. Um, and a lot of times people want me to be that 24-7 rough, tough Leatherman um, because it fulfills their fantasies, so they project that. Yeah really have no interest in in in, in doing that um uh, you know as walt whitman wrote i contain multitudes well thor stockman i've got to thank you for this wonderful interview for inside well, thanks, the history thanks for the opportunity to gab on and i'm okay again thank you mm -hmm.